Good morning. Welcome to chapel. Um, it's so good to be here with you, um, preaching from God's Word uh, to everyone here in Colorado Springs. Uh, so glad to have you here with us. Everyone watching around the nation and around the world, welcome. Um, we have come to Romans chapter 8 in our uh, expository sermon series through the book of Romans. And today's sermon is called Fully Alive in Christ. Fully alive in Christ. And so we'll be in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 1 and reading to verse 11. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Christ's atoning work on the cross. We thank you for new life, Lord, in regeneration as we are reborn and conformed into the very image of Christ. Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God would anoint the words of the Scripture, God, and that they would help conform us to the image of Christ. Lord, may we understand what it truly means to be indwelled by the Spirit of God in salvation. And Lord, for those of us who are in Christ, let us rest in the peace that comes from knowing Christ and being known by Christ. And Lord, as always, I pray if there is anyone under the sound of my voice who is not sure if they belong to Christ, Lord, I pray that by the power of your Spirit, that you would draw them to yourself. And we ask these things in the precious, wonderful, and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we have arrived at what many call the greatest chapter in the scripture. Now, it's true that all scripture is equally important because it is all breathed out by God. There is not a line of inspired scripture that is less important than others because it is all inspired by God from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. But there is something very special about Romans chapter 8 because it really gives us a hopeful glimpse and understanding of what salvation in Christ is actually means to the believer. And it's true and it's, and it's important. Warren Wearsby, a great theologian, said, Romans 8 is a bright and shining light at the end of a long and dark tunnel. He said, Romans 8 is a bright and shining light at the end of a long and dark tunnel. And of course, John Piper says that this is a mountaintop for Christian living and the Christian life. Up until this point, the book of Romans has laid out the hopeless and desperate nature of fallen humanity outside the intervention of God through Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. The two most underpreached parts of the gospel are this, 
the holiness of God and the grievousness of sin. And that is why Paul spends so much of the first seven chapters of Romans laying this out for us. Grace isn't that powerful or important if, if, it's, if it's not saving us from something. If we don't understand how dire our situation truly is, then, then we don't understand how beautiful and precious the amazing grace of God in the gospel actually is. Up until this, this point, the book of Romans has really taken great aim to elevate the holiness of God and to over and over again talk about how grievous, how wicked, how despised sin is by God. Listen, here's a very true statement about the love of God. For God to be perfectly loving, he must also be perfectly just. And perfect justice demands, it demands the righteous punishment of sin. Now, we don't understand this very well because we are born into sin and trespass. Our hearts and our minds are crooked. And we are are children of wrath by nature, Romans 1 tells us. We are not merely affected by sin. We are born into sin and under a curse that we have no way of breaking. We have no way of overcoming. We have no way of getting out of other than divine intervention of God himself. That is why the the true Christian is eternally gracious and grateful for the work that Christ did on the cross. We never get tired of hearing about the cross of Christ sang about or the cross of Christ preach because it is the reason we have life and not death. It's not something we outgrow. It's not the beginning of Christianity. Paul said we preach Christ and Christ crucified, stumbling block to the Jew and foolishness to the Gentile. It is the cross of Jesus Christ that saved us And for us to truly understand what a great salvation we actually have, we must understand how desperate our situation was and how grievous and wicked and offensive sin is to a holy and just God. King David talks about his sin. In Psalm 51, 5, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, And in sin did my mother conceive me. Even before the New Testament, King David understood that he was a sinful man who was born into sin and had a compulsion in his heart to sin. We're talking about a man that God actually called a man after his own heart. But he understood that apart from God, He he had wicked tendencies and and wicked plans and wicked schemes. And we even see in the life of David, some of these things played out. David committed some very grievous sins. He committed adultery and he wasn't out warring with the men that he had sent out into the war field. And and he became complacent and and while committing adultery, impregnated a woman and tried to cover his sin up by having that man killed. And so in Psalm 51, David is acknowledging the fact that he, apart from God, is utterly sinful. How about the prophet Isaiah? When he comes into the presence of a holy God and it says that the train of his robe filled up the temple. And what was Isaiah's response? He said, Lord, I am a man of unclean lips, living among people of unclean lips. Isaiah wasn't comparing himself to to society or comparing himself to his contemporaries or to anyone in humanity. Isaiah was rightfully comparing himself to a holy God who in his presence made him aware of the fact that he was filled with sin and iniquity. Listen, modern Christianity doesn't like this because modern Christianity is very often steps for self-help. Christianity is not a moral therapeutic system of recovery or some sort of idea or plan to to be positive or to take positive steps in your life. 
It is about men and women who are dead in sin and trespass, who have been raised to life in Christ. And once that life is raised in you, there is nothing that can take it away from you. Christ himself is the author and the finisher of our faith. And those of us who are in Christ are being saved, not only from the consequence of our sin, but hear me, we are being saved from the wrath of God himself. Many, many people like to talk about the fact that they're saved, but when you ask them what they're being saved from, they get tongue-tied. They don't know what to say. We are being saved from the wrath of God that's being stored up for humanity, the righteous, rightful wrath of God, the justice of God. Earlier in Romans chapter 3, Paul said, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible is a book of grace and salvation, <clears throat> but it is also a book of condemnation and judgment. And if we don't say that, what we do is we undermine the greatness of that grace and that salvation. It is a book of condemnation and judgment. But for those of us in Christ, for those of us who belong to Christ, we are not subject to that condemnation anymore because we have been saved by Christ into the eternal family of God. We are condemned. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Kind of mirrors what he says in the book of Romans when he says, no one is good. No, not even one. We are also under the power of Satan. That's a strong terminology to use, but there's only two kingdoms. There's only two groups of people. There are people inside Christ, people who have Christ and are had by Christ, people who belong to God, and everybody else is under the demonic control of Satan. And you would say, wait a minute, I know some people who are, Christ who are not Christians, but they're pretty good people. And I'm not going to argue that point. I have friends who don't believe in Christ or are some of the most generous and friendly and nicest people I know. But that doesn't matter. If they are not in Christ, they are part of the kingdom of darkness. 1 John 3, 8 tells us, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now don't confuse what the Apostle John saying. He's not saying that Christians will be sinless. Chapter 7, the, the, the chapter we are in last week, makes it very clear that the Christian man will wrestle and struggle with the sin that was born into his members. But the difference is, is we have a new nature with new desires inside of us that want to keep the law of God and want to live lives of obedience that please God. Not that our works are saving us, but our works and our desire to please God is evidence that the Spirit of God lives in us. We are also under God's judgment. Hebrews 10, 26 through 29 tells us, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer anything that remains a sacrifice for sins but only a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. 
Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse the punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? So we are under God's judgment, not only because we couldn't keep the law, but also because those who resist and turn their back on Christ will be condemning themselves by that as well. And the writer of Hebrews is, is telling us very plainly, he's saying, listen, if you, if you pass by or trample on or dismiss the grace of Christ, then there is no other way of escape for you. Jesus said, listen, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And finally, we are cursed. Galatians 3.10 tells us, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Let me say that again. You could say it this way. All who thinks their good lives and their good deeds can save them are under a curse. Those who believe that they are living up to God's righteous standard are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous will live by faith. And this, my friends, is saving faith. <clears throat> This is what the faith is. The faith is knowing we stand justified before God exclusively because of what Christ did on the cross. Nothing of ourselves. No man can boast. We, we, even the best of us couldn't earn God's salvation or love. And here's what makes grace so beautiful. It's a gift God gave undeserving people. One definition of the word grace is unmerited favor. It means you didn't do anything to get it. You do actually deserve something though. The Bible says your rightful wages and my rightful wages for our lives is death because the wages of sin is death. In chapter one of Romans, <clears throat> Paul explains that condemnation and wrath are being stored up for humanity. That not only will, will there be a final judgment, but there's also going to be people and groups of people and societies under judgment. Why? Because we can't live up to the law, but mostly because even though it is apparent in the imprint of creation and the imago Dei that is imprinted on us, meaning the image of God, that we neither acknowledge God as God or treat him as holy or worship him. And he says, because of this, God is going to not only condemn us in the end, but he's going to turn our minds over to wicked and debaucherous things. It says our minds will become darkened and we'll begin to have unnatural affections. Romans 1.18 says, for the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator 
who is blessed forever. Amen. Paul is saying, listen, because we didn't want God, you can say you're searching for God, you're looking for God, but the truth is the Bible says those who seek will find, and those who knock, the door will be open, and those who ask will receive. Listen, we, we want the things God can provide, but we don't want God. You may want a Savior, but you can't have a Savior that you don't call Lord. And Jesus is Lord. And God is worthy of our praise and our worship and all honor. Our lives were created. The air in our lungs is coursing in and out of our mouths and our noses because we were created to bring glory to God. That is the purpose of your creation. Not to live well and prosper, not to have your best life now, but to do all things for the glory of God. Your career should be for the glory of God. Raising children should be for the glory of God. Listen, eating and sex with your wife and and your hobbies all should be an expression of honor and thanksgiving and glory to God. But we don't want to give glory to God. So the Bible says we pretend like there is no God. Or worsely, we make ourselves God. Or we worship animals. Or we worship nature. Or we worship whatever, anything else. And here's the reason why. Because those things aren't asking anything of us. When God is demanding, is demanding our allegiance, is demanding, listen, The gospel is not some sort of invitation. It's an ultimatum. Follow me or follow your own heart and mind, your own will in your own way and be Lord of your own life. Follow that to your ultimate destruction. Chapter one of of Romans tells us that we are under God's judgment. Chapter 2 elaborates on the righteousness of God's judgment. Chapter 3 explains God's righteousness and shows that compared to him, that no one's righteous on their own merit or works and tells us that no one is good, not even one. Chapter 3 also tells us that there is a way to be righteous, but it is only by putting faith in Christ alone. Chapter 4 explains that even the Jewish patriarch Abraham was justified by faith and not by works, and that the promise God made him about the world being blessed through his seed was fulfilled in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Chapter 5 tells us that the only way to find peace with God is through faith in the atoning work of Christ on the cross, where he explains that all born after Adam were born into sin and death, And sin came into the world through one man, but also sin would be eradicated from the world through one man who is Jesus. Chapter 6 tells us that now that we have been released in Christ through the curse of the law, that we should live dead to sin because we have new life in Christ. And then finally in chapter 7, Paul explains that although we have been released from the law because we are technically dead to it, that we must fight against the sin that is in our members. But we're not fighting so that we will be justified before God. We we are justified on the basis of our faith in Christ. We're not fighting against sin in our members to be justified before God. We are fighting the sin in our members because, brothers and sisters, we are justified before God on the basis of Christ. Because we're saved by grace alone through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scripture alone. And and brothers and sisters, it's all for the glory of God alone. And then we we, we pop into chapter 8, but before we do, let's look at the end of Romans 7 as Paul makes these four laments about just the desperate nature of the sin that he can't seem to completely squelch out, even as a Christian man. His final lament and and crying out is Romans 7, 24 through 25, where he says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's the question that this entire book of Romans has led up to. 
who will deliver us? Listen, that's the question the entire Bible before Christ is asking. Who will deliver us? Who will save us? And not just out of Egypt and not just out of a bad situation and not just out of a momentary pain in our life, but who will save our souls? And he answers the question himself in verse 25 by saying, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. <clears throat> so the question leading into Romans 8.1 is this. So what does it mean for the believer who has truly been born again in Christ and saved by Christ? What does it mean about, what, how, does, how do we relate to all that wrath and judgment that God is storing up for humanity? And then we get to that light, Wearsby calls, at the end of a dark tunnel. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's the greatest news in history. Paul spends seven chapters laying out the contextual foundation for us to understand the greatness and the necessity and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has to show us over and over again that we cannot work our way out of our sin. We can't try our way to God. Our goods are not our good deeds aren't good enough. The best among us isn't good enough. Listen, if one man was good enough, then Jesus died for nothing. But if we were hopeless and helpless, and Paul's saying, listen, if you are in Christ, and if the Spirit of God is living in you, He is saving you. He has saved you. He will save you. And guess what? Because of that, there is no condemnation for you. That is the best news in the history of the world. <clears throat> Paul spends seven chapters explaining why everyone and listen, he makes sure we understand it's both the Jew and the Greek that are subject to the curse and the condemnation of God. But then he says here that if you are in Christ, you are not subject to death that comes from sin because why? Because Jesus took your punishment. That's why in Romans 1.16, when Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power that brings men to salvation, he, he makes sure that he, he, he distinctly makes sure he understands it's everybody. First the Jew, but also the Greek. Because the Jews would have probably thought, well, that's good news for us. And tough luck, you pagan Greeks, you, you pagan Gentiles. And maybe the Greeks to themselves might have thought, well, hey, aren't you the ones who rejected Christ? But the truth is this, all have rejected all were born into sin. All were estranged from God. And there is one exclusive passageway to salvation. And his beautiful and precious name is Jesus. The word condemnation here in the Greek literally means to be condemned to death. That's what condemnation means. Now, sometimes we use the word, you know, hey man, you're being kind of condemning, you know, kind of saying like you're being judgy to me. And I, I think it's probably fine, you know, to use it that way. But the truth is, in, in the original language here, he's talking about a particular kind of condemnation. Condemned to die. The word they use in the Greek here, when that word is attributed to you, it means there's a death sentence hanging over you. It literally means condemned to die. And Paul is saying, you and Christ are no longer under divine judgment but we must point out the fact that if this is true, if the positive of this is true, the inverse is also true. So while it's true that all in Christ are not subject to condemnation, we must honestly and, and, and in a very loving way say that all outside of Christ are subject to judgment and condemnation. We hear the word in Christ. It's a phrase that Paul uses repeatedly in the, epistle, in the epistles. 
He's saying there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ and that the, the fruit of the Spirit will be, will be displayed in those who are in Christ and that there is no righteous judgment reserved for those who are in Christ. Being in Christ is a sort of a picture of being in some sort of safety. And I think one of the best explanations of the Bible that really paint a picture of what it means to be in Christ is the story we find in Genesis of Noah's Ark. We find a man who God tells to build an ark because his righteous wrath is being stored up for wicked humanity. And the book of Hebrews would later tell us that Paul was a, or not Paul, but Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So Noah was preaching this message of salvation and judgment which, by the way, brothers and sisters, those two concepts cannot be divorced from each other. Our salvation is being saved from something. We are being saved from God and His righteous wrath. And that's the picture we see in Noah's Ark. God's wrath was being stored up. And the warning came, and the, the preparation came, and the preaching of righteousness came from Noah. And one day... Noah and his family were safe inside the ark and the door was shut and the wrath of God rained down on humanity. And in a very, you know, scary fashion, we see that God killed every person who was not inside of that boat. This is a picture of the gospel. This is a picture of the world we live in today as we're building this boat, as we're building this life, and the world mocks us, and the world mistreats us, as we say this is the only way of escape, but there's room for you on the ark. There's room for you in Christ. Lay down your life. Surrender to Christ. Make Him Lord of your life, and He'll be Savior of your life. <clears throat> we see the picture here of being in Christ, and we realize being in Christ um, is some sort of uh, explanation of the hypostatic union. Now, that's a, a fancy theological word, but what it really means is the fully divine nature of God and the fully divine nature of Christ as a man. <clears throat> he wasn't God pretending to be a man. He wasn't 50% God, 50% man. He's 100% God, the second person of the Trinity, who attached to his divinity 100% fully man. Now, it's a hard concept to understand, and, and maybe we can't fully understand it in this life, but it's important to realize fully God and fully man is very important. In fact, in 1 John, uh, the apostle John says, if, if someone tries to say that he's not God, then they are a false teacher and they should be rejected. And also the same is true if someone says he's not fully man, and here's why. His humanity fulfilled the law and paid the price for our sin. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So he had to die as a man to pay the penalty for men and women. He paid a human a human price that we should have paid. He also became a curse, a curse in the flesh. Galatians 3, 10 through 14 says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. <clears throat> and Romans already established for, that, for us that that's impossible for any human ever born. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Now hear this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ... So, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might also come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. 
The book of Deuteronomy says, cursed is anyone who's hung on a tree. It was a despicable, undignified, rejected way to die. If someone was hung on a tree, they were supposed to be pulled down by the end of the week so that, that they did, the ground wasn't unclean. And this is one reason why the Romans crucified Jews, because they knew that this was the most disgraceful way that Jews could die. Naked, beaten, and hung out for everyone to see. Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And so Jesus himself became a curse for you and for me in the flesh. But the good news is, it says, so that in Christ Jesus, we might receive the blessing of Abraham, which is being heirs of God himself. And the evidence of that is the spirit of God living in us. <coughs> So that's the flesh, that's, that's his humanity. But because he was God, he also had the power and the right not only to lay down his life, but because he's divine, to raise it up again. John 10, 17 says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. Listen, he's not some suffering Messiah who's dead in the ground somewhere, just some moral example of love. He's God. And he proved that he had mastery over the thing that every human dreads, and that is death. And he says, listen, if you are in me, you too will have life. Hebrews 7.15 says, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent. He's saying not because he was from the tribe of Levi, because he wasn't. He was from the tribe of Judah, not because he had a man-made designation, but it says he has become a priest forever. Why? by the power of an indestructible life. Isn't that a cool thing to hear in the Bible? Jesus is our priest forever because he proved that he has power over death because he himself is the source of life. <clears throat> Moving on to verse two, it says, for the law of the spirit has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for our sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So basically, it just is a summary of all I just said. Christ died as a man a perfect man. Listen, you, you might think, how can one man die for all of humanity? It's because we don't understand the, 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 the value of his innocence that's being exchanged for our guilt. You know, in, in my opinion, I'd rather see a, a hundred guilty men go free uh, if it meant the death or the, the judgment of one innocent person. But see, there really are no innocent people. You hear people say, why do bad things happen to good people? But the truth is that's only happened once. And it was for the sake of our salvation. And that person was Jesus. So because of what Christ did, we are now free to obey God. But we are also free from the consequences of the curse because Christ became a curse for us. <clears throat> it is so important that we understand that in the gospel, God is saving us. From God. Jesus bore our sin and drank the cup of God's wrath that was being stored up for us. And my brothers, this is what we call the great exchange. Jesus exchanged his perfection, his perfect law keeping, his perfect life, and his innocence for our guilt. Don't misunderstand verse 4 though. Verse four, it's not saying that we are righteous because we walk according to the Spirit. It's saying that we walk according to the Spirit as evidence 
of the fact that we are in Christ and that his spirit is living in us and has regenerated us and is sanctifying us. We don't, we don't do, uh, we don't walk according to the spirit to be approved by God. It's evidence that we belong to God. Our desire to please and obey God is evidence that the spirit of God is living in us. That's why Galatians 5, the fruit of the spirit, is not some sort of moral list or chores you do to be a Christian. It's the fruit of the spirit, the evidence that Christ is living in you, that you're filled with the love of God and the gospel. And because of that, you have joy, joy in your salvation, joy in your life, joy that nothing in this world could take from you. It didn't give it to you. It can't take it from you. A peace that passes human understanding. And that kind of person will be patient and kind and good and gentle and self-controlled. Not perfectly, but genuinely and in an ever-increasing way. We have been redeemed by Christ, for Christ, and now we are safely in Christ. Or you could say it this way, we are safely rooted in Christ. John 15, 1, and this is a lot of verses, but, but hear them. John 15, 1 through 11 says, Jesus speaking, <clears throat> he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, those who are not really his, he takes away. But every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that one who bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And branches that wither are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, I so have loved you. Abide in my love. Listen to verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, if you are part of me, if you are actually in Christ, just like verse one said, if you are in Christ, not only are you going to be uh, free of condemnation, but you're also going to bear fruit. Your life's going to change. You're not changing your life to please God. Your life is being changed by God. Your, your desires are changing. Your, your heart is changing. And because of that, the outward appearance of your life is changing. This is basically the same thing the next few verses of Romans 8 says. Starting in verse 5, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the things of the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Those are fruits of the Spirit, by the way. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is not telling you to work harder at doing better. This is saying, listen, if you are in the flesh... Now, listen, I understand many times preachers and even Christians, we say, hell yeah, sorry I did that to you, brother. I was kind of operating in the flesh. Or when we do something that we think is spiritual, we're like, yeah, I was very focused on the spirit there. It's probably fine to talk that way. I think it's okay. But we must understand that's not what Paul is talking about here. Paul is talking about that there are people that are living in the flesh and are of the flesh and their, their end result is death. And they can't please God. 
Your best works as an unregenerate person do not please God. Your works are like filthy rags, it says in, in, in another chapter in Romans. He's saying you can't please God unless the Spirit of God is living in you. This is the imputed righteousness of Christ. We're not trying hard to earn God. We are living from the abundance of the Spirit of God that lives in us. If we are connected to the vine, we will bear fruit. We will be loved by God. We will be loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and good and faithful and gentle and self-controlled. These aren't works we're supposed to do to please God. These are evidences that you are in Christ. You are connected to the vine and that nothing in this world can snatch you from his hand. Brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, you have surety that he who began a good work in you, he who is divine himself, is infecting you and injecting you with life. Yes, we can. We can water that. We can spend time in our word. We can resist the things of the world. Paul tells us to in chapter 7, but we're not doing these things to earn God's love. We're doing these things because we have experienced God's love and we are filled with God's love. Jesus says, those who love me will keep my commandments. He's not saying, if you make a mistake, I don't love you anymore. He's saying, you're gonna follow after me because you belong to me. You're connected to me. My love is in you. Listen, it's not that we loved Christ. We love Christ because he first loved us. <clears throat> Verse 7, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is talking about an unregenerate or an unreborn heart, a heart that is not in Christ. John chapter 3, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, he's trying to explain this to him and he's He's like, you, you will not inherit the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And Nicodemus says, uh, can I go back into my mother's womb? Almost like poking fun at what Jesus said. And Jesus kind of sarcastically back to him says, aren't you the teacher of Israel? Shouldn't you know these things? It's almost like he's saying, didn't you ever read the book of Jeremiah where he says, I will give you a heart of flesh and take away your heart of stone? Don't you know the words of the prophets? Don't you understand why I'm here? He's talking about an unregenerate heart. Although we cannot perfectly keep the law of God, the reborn man or woman is submitted to God's law because they have the imputed righteousness of Christ and they have a new nature that can please God. This doesn't mean a born-again Christian doesn't sin. Paul explains in chapter 7 that we do battle our fallen sinful flesh, but the ongoing battle is evidence. It's evidence that while it's true we're still in our fallen flesh, that there's a new foreign nature that hates sin, that hates not pleasing God, that wants to keep the law, that wants to obey God, that loves God and wants to please him. The positive side though, Paul in verse nine says, you however are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. But he gives the gospel caveat, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. We got to be real careful that we don't tell the unregenerate person sitting in our congregation that they're okay and that God has big plans for their lives and that there's big promises that they can hold to. Spurgeon said that preaching the true gospel is always dividing the room, letting the person who is in Christ know that the promises of God are for them and salvation is for them and God is for them. And not in a begrudging or a mean way, but in a lovingly warning way, letting those who are not in Christ or think they might not be in Christ, maybe that they need to examine themselves or look at their lives. Am I living for Christ? It's the most important question you'll ever ask. 
And I don't have any problem with a new convert who's wrestling with whether or not he's saved. Because later in Romans 8, it's going to tell us that the Spirit of God himself will testify to that. Listen, even in my, in my sin, I, I understand even more so that I need to cling to Christ, that I need to fall into Christ, that I need to bow down and humble myself before Christ. I need him, not just to get to heaven, but for every moment of every day of my life. <clears throat> it, verse nine makes it clear that Paul is talking about being in the flesh. He doesn't mean when Christians fall short or, or they're still growing in an area of sanctification. He is using the word flesh, talking about those who are outside of Christ. And he's saying, if the fact is then that the spirit lives in you and dwells in you, then you are not of the flesh. You are in Christ, free of condemnation, free of spiritual damnation. And this because the spirit of God dwells in you. What did he say? Listen, Jesus is Lord and a priest forever on virtue of his indestructible life. Guess what, brothers and sisters? If you're in Christ, that indestructible life is inside of you. It's inside of you. It's saving you. It's changing you. And you can rest assured that God will not fail. Finally, verse 10 and 11. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit of life because of righteousness, or the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So, in closing, <clears throat> In the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are promised eternal life. But Paul is also saying that if that is true in your life, there will be evidence of Christ's spirit living in you in this life. In other words, there's no such thing as saying, making a confession of faith and never bearing fruit. There is no such thing as people who are of Christ and in Christ who don't follow Christ. There's, there's no such thing I mean, I, I, for years in Teen Challenge, I've heard parents say, yeah, my, my son is an atheist and he claims there's no God and he sells drugs and, you know, he doesn't believe any of this old Bible stuff, but at least he's saved. Because I remember when he was eight, he went down, you know, to the altar and repeated the prayer. <laughs> the salvation mantra is not magic words. It ain't gonna save you. Those words don't save you. What saves you is coming to grips with the fact that God is good, you are not, but if you attach yourself to Christ, you will be saved. The person that makes the true confession of faith will bear fruit. Those connected to Christ who is the vine will bear fruit. Matthew 7, 17 through 20 says, so every, and this is Jesus himself speaking, so every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Your works don't save you. Your life, your good life don't save you. But they are evidence of what's happening in your heart. The truly regenerate person may fall, may fail, may get stuck, may, may have doubting moments, may, may be, but th that person is not turning his back on God. He's not, he can't go on living as a prodigal forever because he who began a good work in you will complete it. Listen, salvation is Christ saving you, continuing to save you through your whole life, and ultimately saving you at the end. The magic words don't save you. Your good works don't save you. But if you are in Christ, you will bear good fruit. John 15, 6 says, if anyone does not abide in me, just it's almost like the words in Matthew 7, like a branch that withers 
he is thrown away and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Listen, the wages of sin is death. Any branch that's not connected to life will be gathered up and thrown into a lake that burns with sulfur and fire. And I don't say that meanly or begrudgingly or because I'm a hell, fire, and brimstone preacher. I say it because it's the truth. It is the truth. There is no more important question to ask your children all the time, to ask your brothers all the time, to ask your lost loved ones all the time. Are you in Christ? Do you know what it means to be in Christ? Listen, Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. And there's nothing wrong with making sure that that evidence is in you. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, the apostle Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you fail to meet the test. What is the test? What's the test? Faith. Genuine faith. There's a man by the name of Richard Wombrand. Richard Wombrand was a, uh, a Christian man in Romania who was under a, uh, a socialist communist regime. And they were very brutal and began to imprison Christians. And many of the leaders were, were basically told to recant their faith publicly or they'd be thrown in prison. And most of them did. But Richard Wombrandt wouldn't, and he continued to preach the gospel and stand for Christ. And they threw him into a Romanian prison. And he was there for 14 years. And they would beat him, and they would torture him, and they imprisoned him and kept him from his family. There was even several occasions where some of the higher-ups came to him and said, listen, if you will go and recant your faith, we don't even care if you, you do it behind closed doors, but if you will publicly recant your faith, we'll let you go. You go home, be with your wife, be with your kids. He says, I cannot. And eventually he would get out of prison. He would start a ministry called Voice of the Martyrs. And this would be a worldwide missions organization that has taken the gospel literally all around this world. And Richard Wombrand has written books, one called Tortured for Christ. They made a movie of it. Uh, many other books about his time in prison. And he's preached at all churches and crusades all across the world. And they asked him once, they said, a reporter came up to him and they said, listen, what is the greatest accomplishment of your life? And he said, it was being counted worthy to suffer for 14 years in prison for the name of Christ. And in that same interview, he made this statement, a faith that can be broke by suffering is no faith at all. Wow. Wow. But I'm here to tell you, brothers, for those of us whose faith is genuinely and truly in Christ, that nothing can break that faith in us. Jesus says in John 16, 33, you will have tribulation in this world, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. And brothers, if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, so have you and so will you not just in the life to come, but in this life, you will bear fruit. You'll be able to stand the test. and God will keep you to the end. There's no more important you can ask than this. Are you in Christ? Are you safe inside the ark? The righteous wrath and judgment of God is coming, and there's only one way of escape. And it's not living a good life. It's not self-improvement. It's not positive confession. It's not good vibes. It's not by law keeping. It's not by putting your hope in anything other than Christ alone. It's by putting the entirety of your faith and your hope in Christ, surrendering everything, calling upon Christ as Savior and Lord, because you can't call him Savior if you don't call him Lord, then you will be free of condemnation. Go from death to life because if the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, 
guess what? You're not subject to condemnation anymore. You're not only pardoned from your sins and the consequence of your sins, you are sons and daughters of God himself. That is good news. That is the gospel. That is what it means to be in Christ. Listen, we don't just surrender to Christ to avoid judgment and condemnation, but it is a a reality of being in Christ. We follow Christ because we love him, because he laid his life down for us, and because he has called us friend. God, I thank you for this word, Lord, for this, this word that just like a sledgehammer, hits me in the heart every time I read it, God. Lord, I I thank you for dying on a cross for a wretched sinner like me. God, I thank you for the fact that you died for sinners in the United States, God, those who are in the ditch with needles in their arms and those who are living well-adjusted, upper-middle-class lives somewhere in middle America. But the gospel isn't just for the American. It is not just for the Jew, God. It's a gospel that's good news in in Nairobi, God, in in, in Cairo, Egypt, in Iran, and God, in Ghana, Africa, and in Scotland, in China, in every place in the world where there are image bearers of God who need to hear the good news about Jesus. Oh, Lord, send us. Send your message, Lord, across this world. But Lord, in my life, use me in my small context, Lord, in my sphere of influence to preach the wonderful, life-saving news that anyone in Christ is a new creation. There's no condemnation and that your arms are open to all who would call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.